Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Zena Harris, and I'm the president of Green Spark Group and the creative director of the Sustainable Production Forum. I would like to welcome you to the final panel of the 2020 Sustainable Production Forum presented by SIM. It has been such a pleasure to host these panels and keep these important conversations going virtually. First off, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapulia, and Molala, and many other indigenous people who made their homes along the Columbia River. Greenspark Group kickstarted the Sustainable Production Forum five years ago. We are focused on changing the climate of entertainment, and we work with stakeholders that share this same vision. This means working across the motion picture industry with productions, media companies, and industry organizations to consistently integrate sustainable practices on their shows and in their operations. The SPF is our way of gathering filmmakers, thought leaders, and experts to share knowledge and inspire a culture of change. I would like to take a moment to run through some instructions and Zoom features we have available. The chat box will be left open for general discussion among attendees and panelists throughout the panel discussion. This is where we will post any links and contact information mentioned during the event. The Q&A box will be monitored throughout the event, so please direct your questions for the panelists in that space. You are also able to upvote questions and the moderator will prioritize those that are of interest to many attendees. And finally, the recording of the event will be shared with you afterward. Before we dive in any further, I'd like to give a big thanks to our presenting sponsor of the 2020 Sustainable Production Forum, SIM. And thank you to our producer panel sponsor, Real Green. Here to provide some remarks is Manager of Production Services at Creative BC, Julie Bernard. Hi everyone, great to see you all. I wish I could see you in person. Um, so I'm Julie Bernard and I oversee the Real Green Initiative housed at Creative BC, working closely with our 17 industry partners comprised of unions, guilds, producers, organizations, facility and equipment owners, all who provide funding and strategic oversight of the program. Real Green is proud to be sponsoring this panel today. It should be an inspiring conversation with producers from around the world discussing challenges, solutions, and the future for sustainable production. Real Green was started back in 06 at the BC Film Commission. And for the last five years, supported by Creative BC, working with BC Film's industry stakeholders to advance the adoption of sustainable practices in the motion picture industry. Recently, Real Green and Creative BC formed the Clean Energy Committee, born out of the need to create better resources and provide guidance for clean energy initiatives to help reduce the motion picture industry's consumption of fossil fuels, helping to enhance BC's position as the greenest production center in the world. BC has been leading the way and helping to inspire other national organizations. Real Green is now guiding Ontario, Manitoba, and Quebec, as well as CBC, in their quest for greener productions and are actively engaged with other provincial film commissions across Canada. This shows the power of collaboration to motivate all levels of the industry. As some of you are aware, Real Green has a formal collaboration with BAFTA's Albert Initiative in the UK. And we see the value of working together nationally and internationally to amplify the message and the importance of sustainable production worldwide. Through our collaboration with BAFTA, we have just launched our carbon calculator so that productions can start to measure their footprints. Eventually, we'll be able to aggregate data to better understand local trends, transforming the industry. One of our main priorities at Real Green is education. Our climate and sustainability production course, currently online, has trained over 750 members of the film industry for free. We want to double that next year. And our higher education outreach program has been very successful in implementing integration of sustainability and best practices into the curriculum at our local film schools. We continue to hold bi-monthly Real Green meetings where we bring in speakers, encourage roundtable discussions, producing industry solutions and innovation to share back out into the industry. 
Real Green produces a monthly newsletter highlighting sustainable achievements out there, sharing our stories, hoping to inspire and motivate others. Our priority is to change behaviors and have sustainable production top of mind, showing what's possible both on set and on the screen. It's Real Green's mission to create more awareness and empowerment, making it easier to lighten your footprint. Together, we have the potential to truly make a difference and help shape a greener world. If you'd like to learn more about Real Green, please check out our website, realgreen.ca. I also wanted to say how amazing it has been working with, my, with such a, an eco-champion and Zena Harris. We are all very lucky to have her expertise here in BC. Thanks so much for being here today. Enjoy this amazing panel. Back to you, Zena. Awesome, thank you, Julie. Um, all right, let's get going. Um, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Clara George. Clara has a proven track record of advancing sustainable production solutions in her 25 years of producing television. Clara is a Real Green ambassador, an SPF champion, and was part of the Women for Climate Mentorship Program in 2019, where she worked with the City of Vancouver to advance clean energy policy for the film and television industry. Clara has decided to focus on sustainability in the industry and is currently VP of Studio and Sustainable Production Services for Sim International. Please welcome Clara George. Thank you, Zena. Um, and thanks, Julie, as well, for Real Green and everything that you guys do. Um, and welcome, everyone, to the producers panel. Um, I'm Clara. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm living and working on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Squamish Nation. And I'm excited and honored to be your moderator today. We are all so lucky to be working in such a creative and innovative industry. And we are here because we know that producing film and television has a significant environmental impact. We know what needs to happen to change that. We've heard all the solutions, yet we still hear the same horror stories over and over again. Today, we are going to hear firsthand how these trailblazing producers are telling a new story. They're going to tell us how they are building a culture of sustainability with their crews, on their shows, and throughout the industry. So let's welcome our panelists. Um, your panelists today are Tyson Bidner, Lydia Dean Pelcher, Philip Gassman, and Gavin Bierman. Unfortunately, Kim Todd is on set and was unable to make it today. To start off, each panelist will give us a brief introduction of who they are, what they're working on, and then we'll move to the discussion and the Q&A portion. We encourage you to ask questions and upvote those that you'd like asked out loud. So first, let's welcome Tyson. Thank you so much, Clara. Nice to meet everyone. My name is Tyson Bidner, and I am a production manager and line producer working in New York. I'm currently preparing for a next season of a Hulu show called Rami. Um, and I'm finishing up an Apple project that was shooting in New York called Lisey's Story and uh, an Epics show um, called Bridge and Tunnel. Um, you know, now that we've sort of jumped into production uh, during the time of COVID, I've learned quite a bit. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about that later on. But I'm very grateful to be here and to talk to you and to meet everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Tyson. Um, next up. Lydia, Lydia. Welcome, Lydia. Hi, <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, I have produced both studio and independent films and have worked quite a bit internationally. Um, India, many films with director Mir Nair, and in Africa, um, our last film there was Queen of Catway with Disney. I've been greening sets wherever I am for all of my career. A lot of my early work and sustainability was with HBO, who was also an early supporter of producers who wanted to green sets. And I'm co-founder of PGA Green. It's an initiative of the Producers Guild of America. And we have partnered with 11 studios and production company partners who together um, have created a website of tools and resources, greenproductionguide.com. Most recently, I co-directed a film, Radium Girls, which is in release right now and combines my passion for the environment and climate justice with my narrative storytelling career. Thank you. Thanks, Lydia. Um, our next panelist is Philip Gassman. Okay. 
A warm welcome from Munich in Germany. It's, it's soon time to go to bed over here. We're hitting eight o'clock at night. And uh, thanks for inviting me on this, on this panel. I'm really excited to uh, see all these people, all this interest in this topic. I'm a director and producer now since uh, 30 years, uh, working uh, for pretty much all of the German broadcasters, mainly doing big TV shows, um, documentaries, working pretty much in all kinds of fields of TV entertainment. And 10 years ago, I got really intrigued by our ecological environmental impact and I started really diving deeper into this topic, realizing that we need to do a lot over here. And um, I, I took a lot of research into all the different departments, all the different technologies, and I started teaching this to my colleagues, which soon became bigger and bigger and bigger. And now I've been pretty much counseling uh, several big TV channels in Germany on this topic. I wrote the guidelines on the rules for several broadcasters and I developed the first professional training in Germany for green experts for film and television. So thanks again for having me and I'm really excited to hear from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and Gavin, you're up. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Gavin Bierman. I'm a Currently a co-producer on um, Lucasfilm's uh, upcoming show, won't be out until 2022, uh, called uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, I've been with them now for the last, I don't know, couple of years. Uh, got season two of The Mandalorian, which I was working on uh, during the last conference, um, which is coming out this week, um, where we really push the envelope and sustainability practices on that show. Um, you know, I've kind of come into sustainability uh, you know, my personal life as much as possible. And now that I've moved into, you know, more juice on set and, and co-producing, um, you know, more uh, continuously, I've been able to really try to be as activist as possible with folding, you know, insustainable practices into our operations on set and, and all the places that we are. And, um, you know, what my big thing is to try to do is to push it as much as we possibly can. So we, of course, you know, do everything that's normal and, and that everyone else is trying to do. But then I'm always looking uh, for pilot programs and other things that we can try out uh, to see if it works. And then hopefully that will be adopted by more, more shows in the industry. So I look forward to, uh, you know, being part of this panel and, uh, and meeting all of you. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, let's jump in. So if all the panelists can, yeah, great, turn your cameras on. Um, so one thing that always we know, we're the producers, right? It always falls on us. No matter what happens, the good, the bad, it's our fault, right? It's our successes, it's our failures. So, and you know, clearly I'm looking at a bunch of amazing producers who have all chosen to put sustainability as a mandate on their sets and tried to change the culture of their sets. But can, how did you start? Like, what was the, what was the, you pro, when you made that decision, what was your first move? Lydia, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, I'm happy to jump in. I like to talk about our green initiative at the moment that people are hired. It's a, it's a piece of the conversation. And at the, we talk about it at the production meeting and we, as we get closer to shooting, I like to organize a green team of cast and crew. It's voluntary. I just put the word out there. If anybody wants to come have a, have a cappuccino, a green tea with me one morning. And then we all talk about um, achievable goals and initiatives that a lot of my production team has already been talking about, but it's always great to involve the crew in that kind of iterative process and to get involved. And then we meet periodically over the course of the show to talk about the goals and what we took on at the beginning. And it's always great to report back to the crew in emails. We do two or three emails over the course of the show. People love to hear this. They, they might not be aware of what the collective impact is if you don't sort of get, send out the bulletins and update them. So it's an ongoing process of really making it a team effort with the cast and the crew. Gavin, what do you, how did you start? What was your first move? Um, you know, I was inspired a number of years ago by uh, Diana Picorni, um, who um, I did a show with and met rather recently. And, um, you know, she was just so inspiring. She was on part of the panel last year and uh, she's been greening sets for decades, right? And, you know, I've always been interested in it. 
and always had it in my own life and, and realized that, you know what, like now that I'm actually, you know, production managing and line producing, like I, I really want to, you know, take this on as, as an activism. And it's been, you know, such a wonderful experience. I kind of partnered with uh, Adrian Pfeiffer, who's a, a longtime friend and is also, you know, part of Green Spark and, until recently. And now she's back with me full time. I've had the luxury, honestly, and I know not many people do, of actually being able to hire a full time sustainability manager on the show because of the the scope of the shows that we're doing. So they're so large, and and I, I managed to talk the studio you know, into paying for that. And, and it's made such a huge difference where I actually have an emissary because I'm always so jammed up with everything, you know, just running, helping run the show, you know, to have her meeting with the departments, we do kickoffs and we talk about goals and practices and all the things that we could, you know, take on and then look to the department heads for like, what ideas do you have? What have you seen um, in your daily life or over your, your 20, 30 years? Because, you know, again, I feel very fortunate. I get to work with some of the most amazing department heads in either Los Angeles and abroad that have all done shows of massive scale. So they've seen so much and, and over the years and like, you know, like yesterday we had a meeting, you know, we're just onboarding our crew now. And we had a great meeting with John Hoskins, our, our construction coordinator. And, you know, just seeing, you know, people that, you know, haven't had this opportunity to participate or bring their own ideas and, and people as intelligent and successful as John, you know, coming up with, hey, well, let's try, you know, let's try talking about building materials and I'll give you, you know, two budgets. We can look at the one that uses less wasteful products and we can look at the budget that, you know, has, has more and we can decide how to, you know, go about you know, building our sets in, in a more sustainable way. So we got, you know, that kind of going on too, but it's, um, it's really all about, you know, for me, it's been is, is having Adrian by my side and, and helping us uh, get out and meeting with all the department heads and getting them involved and, and, and then taking that in combination with partnering, actually it's been the last number of shows with D Disney sustainability, um, which is also amazing to have that infrastructure at a studio level. Um, where they've helped us um, pilot new programs and, and help finance those to some extent as well. And it's been, it's just been really wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's certainly great that you're so supported. I, I mean, I know already in the chat, the big elephant in the room is how do you afford sustainability, right? Um, yeah, and, and you know, the, first, the first thing I'll do is try to make it, you know, zero sum, you know, the same amount of money. So it's always a constant conversation because, you know, I'll work with more pragmatic people above the line um, and say, well, that doesn't make sense. We're spending more money on that. So that's, you know, it's, it's a constant conversation of how to justify some of these programs and practices to make it make sense. Yeah, which, which isn't new conversations for us. We have to, we have to justify it all the time. So um, I'm always kind of surprised when people pull that out of the budget and it's like, Oh, as opposed to what sets we build, what actors we hire, where we're shooting, how what we're feeding, like where we're stopping for lunch, how much the wrap party is, like we're making decisions, monetary decisions all day long. So, um, you know, it, it's, I personally thought I actually saved money by going green. Um, Tyson, what's your opinion? You will always save money if sustainability is done correctly. <clears throat> the challenge is going to be at times if you don't have the support of a studio um, to find that initial money from a budget that's already strapped to be able to dedicate to sustainability. In the end, if you have a dedicated team or, or resources towards it, it will always pay off in the end. One of the challenges that I think we necessarily may not face uh, the group here, but maybe those listening is, you could be on a show where you have no support from a studio, you have uh, producers and production managers that are ambivalent and, and busy with other things, so it's not top of mind, and, but it's very passionate to you as a crew member. So, so how do you uh, make it a priority to do best practices of sustainability when you feel like you don't have the support from the studio and you don't have the support uh, from, from the uh, producers and you, you don't have a dedicated green spark on set, that, that becomes a real challenge. Um, but I think what's great is, you know, people like Lydia, people like Gavin have created, you know, even what Lydia was saying about how she has the crew members come and talk and hears them. She's then created a community that will go on to other jobs and will have learned something 
And even if they're on a job that people are ambivalent or not, uh, not as passionate about these issues, they could become passionate and show their producers, there's no cost if we donate this set after we're done to another job or reuse or we do this or we do that. And people can also show top, top up, this is how we could save money by doing it this way. So all of the work that's done has a lasting effect for this community even if the, you are frustrated that on your job, you're not getting the support that you need. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely true. Um, Phil, what is it like in Europe? Are you, is it the same in the film production scene there in terms of sustainability challenges? I guess it's pretty much the same everywhere. And, and uh, just going back to the question before, I think you need, and that has always proven to be right, you need to give a good reason to do it. And I realized with the team, sometimes we think or we thought that people know exactly what it's all about. They know it's important to do it. And we didn't give this kind of a good reason or good reasons why we should, we should go for sustainable production. And it was always a nightmare because there were always people in the crew then starting to criticize, doubting what we're actually doing. So you really need this very strong incentive at the very beginning and give people good reasons why we're doing it. And you also have to provide training. And that's another thing uh, that we found out. We're talking about high tech when it comes to green production. And that's something that I find very, very useful because when you make people understand that there are a lot of creative advantages to go green because we're talking about new tools, new technologies, but that also involves training. So also you have to kind of provide this kind of stuff because otherwise people will be still in their old mindsets and will not be willing to go uh, for green. And the last thing also that we realized you need a good report. You need to, at the very end also to reward people in terms of making them also see what their actions have actually done, what ha has actually been achieved throughout the production. And this altogether has proven to be a, a quite a successful uh, way to do it. And now I can really say in Germany, pretty much all of the German TV channels now definitely go for green. We have several TV channels in Germany who ask a green production. It's mandatory. You have to produce in a sustainable way. So things have been, cha have been changing tremendously over the last two years. And I'm really happy about this kind of uh, development. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think that the, the tools that are available to us now and, um, you know, the awareness of, of the crew at large it has been fantastic. And where, you know, a few years ago, I would say, oh, well, you know, we're reducing our beef on set. And somebody would go, why? I'm like, you know, I, I don't have to explain that anymore. I mean, I think that look, there's kind of a global awareness, but I think there's still a, there's still a, there's still film immunity, right? We all think we can do it differently. We can get away with it. It's like, you know, the real rules of life don't apply. So what happens when you've, you've set up your production, you've, you've put out the memos, you've talked to everybody, and then you get a situation, a scene, a location, something that you know, this is not, there, it, you can make it greener, right? But it's not going to be green. How do you message that when you've already kind of set up that, oh, we're the green production, and now suddenly we have 15 generators running because of the lo what we picked for the location? Gavin, it looks like you've done that. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at a location right now where I'm like, oh, God. Um, you know, we have a back lot, you know, which we'll have a long presence at, and, you know, I, it's tough. It, it really is. It breaks my heart sometimes too, where I'm like, you know, bringing in, you know, electrical contractors to see how long we can run lines to tie into the grid and knowing that it's probably not going to work out. And, you know, I just, I just gotta keep saying, we'll do the best that we can. You know, the, the fact that we're, you know, at this location in LA, you know, we can try to put some solar out there. Um, I've been, working with renewable diesel i believe i brought up at the last conference where at least you know that's a fuel source and we are powering generators that we lean into because it's not a petroleum-based product um it's just you gotta really dig deep and look where you can um to try to offset you know the damage that you're doing by you know going traditional uh when you have no other choice and um lydia how about you have you run into that yeah i you know, I think there's 
always going to be instances where, but you know, particularly because we're like a, we're like a moving circus, you know, where there, there is the studio infrastructure scenario. And then there's the location scenario where you really, you know, are thrown curveballs constantly. And you do, we do the best we can. We set achievable goals so that we feel like this is what we're going to strive for so that we can achieve it. But at the same time, I've always loved incorporating sort of a community building outside the crew and a, sort of a carbon offset component. So in other words, if we're in a situation where I really feel like we're impacting a community and we're not, we're, what can we do to sort of leave something behind that's more sustainable for that community? And, you know, it could be, um, a, it could in, I just did a mini series in India with the BBC and we were shooting in places that really needed a lot of help. And we found a local activist who worked with us on river cleanups. And she actually even came in and did other initiatives with us on set. But it was a way of um, really addressing dire situations in a sort of more global way and involving the crew in it. I mean, you can do tree planting. You can, there's all different kinds of things that you can do just as an extra thing to represent that you're bearing this in mind and you're countering it in another way. That sounds fantastic. I mean, that, uh, congratulations. That's amazing. Um, did you find that you had, again, a hard time convincing the crew, the cast, the studio, everybody to kind of buy into to this extra work? Sometimes, you know, sometimes we were, you know, we were filming in India in a time when the air pollution was, there's a few months when the air pollution is so bad, it's, they, they make it an equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and trying to get the crew to wear masks. I mean, now I think it's not so hard. We've all become mask savvy, but at that time it was a real, it was a real effort. And I thought back to when I first was trying to, I banned water bottles on the set. That's just a given. Like we're not even talking about it. They're not there. But even to do that years ago, it was all about getting, you know, department heads to put that, you know, reusable bottle on their belt loop and getting the people on the crew that the crew looks up to to really get on board. And that's what I did with the masks as well when we had this really serious air pollution problem. We were putting the stats right at the top of the call sheet every day. And we got, we tried to do really, really focused work on people who are leaders on set that could set the standard and the model. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I think that's amazing. And I think that the one thing that we kind of, we've touched on and we all have going for us is that we move from show to show to show. Right, and, and you, you get the sustainable champions, you get the crew leaders, and you get leaders just, you know, you can tell when your first AD is awesome. Like you, everyone knows in a minute, and then they'll follow that person, or whether it's the camera operator, the DP, or whoever, whoever kind of comes out as that leader. I think if you engage that person in your, I guess your, your mission statement, or whatever you're planning to do on the course of the show, um, you know, I always find that, it, it's a lot more effective to engage the champions who are already there and to kind of find that crew member who's dying to say, I really don't think we should be doing this to like give them a voice rather than to try and convince the people who think you're crazy to change everything. Because, you know, we're a culture that follows a leader. That's, you know, we're not a democratic system, right? Like, like if you have a leader, people will follow it. Um, question. Yeah. The education, Sorry, part of, the education part is important too. Well, we did a food waste initiative with our Indian activists because food waste is a big deal in India. Food is precious. And so we, the crew didn't exactly know what was happening, but we put a lot of education up in the, in the catering tent about food waste. And the goal was you know, to only take the amount of food that you're really going to eat. And whoever delivered their, their plate, if they hadn't left any food on the plate, they got a green ribbon pin. And when you have your DP and your first AD walking around set with their green ribbon pins, then everybody wants to talk about this issue of food waste. And then that, that sort of tumbles into other sustainable conversations. So it was a very simple thing to do. Um, and the Indian um, Green Initiative activists had the idea and we, everybody loved it. It was fun. Yeah, I, th I find that, um, especially on, on film sets, a lot of the kind of camaraderie and a lot of the bonding is negative, 
It's about, you know, it's, you're shooting in the middle of the night, it's pouring rain, everyone's cold, everyone's boots are leaking, they all bond together, suddenly we're all best friends and you have a war story, right? Um, but I think that this is a way of creating positive bonding because we all know when we walk, you know, every single person who walks onto a film set goes, oh my God, there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of garbage, there's a lot of food, there's a lot of, you know, gas, whatever it is. and probably don't feel great about it. So I think that giving the crew an opportunity, especially now when there's so much added pressure in the world to succeed, to win, it's a win, you know? Um, Tyson, you've been shooting in, in COVID times. How are, how's that going? How's You know, it, it's tough because I think there's such an anxiety that people come to that haven't started shooting yet uh, that overtakes everything. Um, and that anxiety leads to decisions sometimes that um, are efficient for COVID purposes. But sometimes to me, it feels like we're set, setting back some of the great initiatives and gains that we made in sustainability. There's some silver lining, right? No one's using paper anymore. Uh, people aren't flying around as much. People are, you know, so there is some, some of that that's happening as you're moving forward. But, you know, a lot of the processes now are thought uh, with COVID first and foremost, and sometimes at the expense of a green set, whether that be catering, uh, single individual snacks, wrapped snacks, things to that. So once we get more comfortable uh, and feel safe in the environment of COVID, the next layer is to continue to refine and continue to, to make sustainability work in conjunction with COVID safety. And there's a lot of things that are happening there. People now, especially, uh, think about an independent film that only had a certain amount of money to make that film. Now 15 to 20% of that budget is going towards COVID. So how do they still have money if they're, you know, to ha hire that person to do sustainability? Uh, as a full-time job for them that they used to have, right? Well, maybe the person that you're hiring to help sanitize your sets has a dual role. Maybe that person is a sustainability expert that's also sanitizing your sets. And they could be helping looking into the, the best uh, practices for some of these cleaning products and keeping people safe. So there are ways to sort of mesh it all together as we plan, you know, and as we get more comfortable, um, working in this environment, we're going to keep layering it and, and dealing with these challenges that are coming up. Phil, how is, how is uh, what do you think the link is with COVID and sustainability? Is, is it presenting more challenges for us or is it, I mean, ironically, it's, it's the same problem, you know, like a lot of, a lot of the disregard, like we want better air quality, we want less paper, we want less you know, we want to streamline what we're doing, spend less time, you know, how does that, how is that working, do you think? Was it me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the fill, that's, that's why. Well, uh, of course, um, we, we have that, that terrible issue over here as well. Uh, our, I just recently saw a 30 pages long COVID best practice guide for productions. And the number is absolutely correct. We have these 15% extra costs are exactly the same over here. So we're facing exactly the same issues. Um, I think it, it's one thing that is really interesting in that regard is to understand psychologically what's, what's actually happening. And of course, we learn a lot about when do people engage in issues and when don't they engage in issues. And that's exactly what we're, I think, facing with the green issue. When are people really willing to do something for it and when uh, are they kind of reluctant to do it? And the second thing, which I think could be uh, a, 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 an extra answer or a little giveaway um, when it comes to the cost situation, I speak with a lot of colleagues right now because we know that there's going to be less money. This money that's actually spent on, on COVID will be lacking next year on the next years uh, when it comes to funding movies, to funding uh, production. So we will have to uh, come down with our budgets. There, there will be less money. So uh, what I'm really facing a lot is trying to get that ghost out of the room. And this ghost is the ghost telling people that green production is more expensive. We, we had that before. 
And when people understand that a green production is a more effective production as well and can also uh, save quite substantial amounts of money, then all of a sudden a green production is also a potential help for the future also when it comes to the economical situation that is created by COVID. So that could be something that can help uh, for the future. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent transition. Lydia? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, I, you know, these global crises of um, a pandemic and climate change are not unrelated. And I think the way yes. we talk about that is important as we um, yes. work with the culture on our set. And I just wanted to point out on greenproductionguide.com, the studio partners and the producers have worked really hard on putting together a COVID-19 return to work resources mm -hmm. um, report. And it's, it's on the homepage. There's a button there that you can go to. And it, it, has, it has this kind of conversation that I was just talking about and sort of ways to talk about that. But it also includes, again, really valuable resources about mm -hmm. PPE recycling programs, um, battery powered mobile generators, disinfecting green cleaning products, um, you know, all, canned water where you can get, I mean, we, they were, we just had endless conversations about it to, uh, I think, a great effect, you know, when the pandemic came down. And these are resources that we really hope people will, you know, take on board with their sustainability program. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, one of the questions is, uh, that came up is, you know, it's, again, it always, the question always seems to come up down is but to budget, right? But the reality is, is that if you're being green, you're consuming less. So you're spending less. Yeah. Like, it's just that simple, you know? And sometimes those costs are hidden in different ways. For example, it, it drives me absolutely crazy that the fuel budget for the generator is not part of the electrical budget. You know, it's and and meanwhile, it's not part of the transport budget because they're fuel and everything, so they don't care. So somehow, fuel, which is the largest aspect of any film production impact, is not nobody's accountable for it. And and I would love to see when the you know when the rigging gaffer or the location manager is putting in their budget, they have calculated how much fuel they are going to need to run the set by not getting a tie-in. You know, and then suddenly those numbers would be a lot, you know, they would make everyone understand and think of what the, you know, what their choices are. And, and yes, Gavin, certainly I've been in places where it's like, oh my God, we have generators everywhere and there's nothing we can do. And then, and then it's kind of, okay, so maybe, maybe we need to use less. Maybe we need to power less. Maybe we need to have a conversation of changing how much power we're actually drawing, you know, or, or how can that happen? And we don't have all the tools yet, or they're not scalable yet. We have electric, you know, we have electric power sources. We have, um, you know, solar paneled motor homes. We don't have enough to supply every single production in the world. So how do we, how do we as producers drive that, that technology change. I mean, we're the film industry and we got rid of film in five years. Mm. Like we went from film to digital like that. So why is this taking so long when we're an industry, we know the studios have the mandates, we've got, you know, the production guides, the sustainability guides, we've got the green committees, we've got all these people. Why is this, why does this feel like it's taking so long? I like to say that, you know, the studios have been calculating their carbon footprints for years, um, kind of unofficially, and the greenproductionguide.com has a carbon calculator on it. It's not, a man, it's not a studio mandated tool, but it's a very effective tool because if we always say, if you want to change something, you need to see it. If you can, can't see it, you have to measure it in some way. And the carbon calculation is a tool that's very effective. And when we did the um, miniseries in India, A Suitable Boy, it was BBC and they did mandate carbon calculation. Every, you, it's part of your paperwork delivery to BBC is your carbon calculation numbers and your, and your sustainability report. And that's a terrific thing because, you know, as a producer, to be able to have that kind of, you know, support from the, from the financing entity is terrific. And I think we're, um, you know, but the importance of carbon calculation for all the reasons that you're saying is really important. Uh, if I can just add something to this, 
um, because uh, for us, for many productions, we, we make a very thorough protocol, meaning that the guys with the generators, they have to write down their consumption. You know, and the, the great thing, we just had this recently on a, on a big production, we realized that uh, the generators were up to 25% of the total CO2 emissions of the total production. Mm -hmm. So the guys really felt bad. You know, they felt guilty. They felt, oh my God, we're responsible for 25% of the CO2 emissions. So they said, we're not going to do it again, you know, because in, in terms of, okay, next time we'll do better. And I think that's where numbers help, you know, and when you can really confront people and tell them, listen, we made a calculation, we just checked this out, and look, this is your numbers, you know, can we maybe try next time to do this in a different way? And I've seen a lot of people after things like that, they said, hey, Philip, we're never going to do this again, we'll change it, because now we understand this is a big, big issue. So I think that that's one thing that helps. And the other thing to me that that's extremely important is the availability of tools, of different cars, different trucks. So we've been working a lot in Germany now on getting better cars, better trucks, and we really made a lot of, put a lot of pressure on the rental companies. And one of the major German film companies, film production companies, they basically almost blackmailed the rental company. They said, hey, if we don't get better, greener cars, better, greener trucks, we're gonna switch to another company. And within two weeks, these guys bought a lot of new trucks and new cars, greener cars, greener trucks, and uh, th that was a significant change here. And now all of a sudden, throughout the whole business, we have a lot better, a lot more better tools, a lot more better trucks, cars, et cetera, because there's been a big pressure from the industry on the rental and the servicing companies. And I think this is really important also to act on this level. We did that, we did that in Vancouver as well a couple of years ago. We realized mm -hmm. that, um, we had no hybrids in our rental pool available period and we we the producers all got together and signed a letter saying that they would support hybrid cars and then we kind of peddled it to all of the rental companies and uh uh one of them drive force said okay well how many do you need and we said well all of them we need we need all of your cars to be more fuel efficient so um they've been turning them over ever since then you know kind of 10 at a time every couple of months they bring in another 10 another 10 another 10 and they are always out so you know that kind of unity you know we can't i, I think it's important that we don't throw up our hands and go oh doesn't exist and move on you know i mean we're not by nature, none of us in this industry are those kind of people anyway. So to keep kind of driving and communicating and talking to each other and, and on every level, every set, I think is how we're going to make this change. Um, I'm still really frustrated that it's happening so slowly, but um, Tyson, what about you? Yeah, no, I think a lot, of, a lot of change happens quickly in our industry and a lot of change happens very slowly. I mean, some of the equipment we've been using for hundreds of years, like an Apple box, right? I mean, there's just some things that just haven't changed. And I think it's, it's important just to, to expand upon, you know, what, what, what everyone said is if every department sort of pushes in the same way that, that the Vancouver producers pushed the rental car agencies, if, if gaffers and best boys, uh, you know, if, if, if prop folks, you know, if, if everyone sort of pushed their own vendor, their own uh, person, you know, their own uh, lighting source, however, they, wherever they go for, for equipment to, to move in these directions as a unified force, this kind of change will happen. Because once we find a vendor or a partner that will have something that we want um, that is, is, is more sustainable, that is, you know, better for, for, for the environment and for our set and for efficiency, everyone will move towards that and then everyone will change and, and accompany that. So it's, it, it could be the producers pushing up top, but everyone on every level has to do their part, no matter what your job is, to demand more from your vendors, from your partners. Yeah. Gavin, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the new things that is happening that I'm seeing in the industry just because of the place where I'm sitting is um, the advent of virtual production and how that's starting to make a push into changing actually how we produce projects. Now, I don't think we'll ever have 100% push into virtual production, but it is kind of catching fire amongst um, many um, studios now and looking into doing this. And, you know, what we've accomplished on The Mandalorian and now that we're going to do also with Obi-Wan is, 
you know, um, is we build these LED volume spaces that are basically like live green screens, right? And what that um, allows for is a, a huge reduction in, um, in travel costs because all we have to do is now send a small photogrammetry team out to a location instead of sending the whole crew. Um, we're only building partial sets as they tie into the LED content. So you're seeing a reduction in the amount of materials being used. Um, so those two things alone, I think, are, are starting a huge shift in that regard. And I'm hoping that it also takes on, you know, we're, we're actually able to do this now, which I know um, we weren't able to do before is with, you know, forced by COVID, of course, is all the remote work. And, and you know, this whole front end process of virtual production, we've got all of these guys, all of our previous guys in our virtual art department are all working remotely. So there's no, you know, travel for them either. And I'm in, sitting here in an office with a skeleton crew only because I've got some grips now building the other LED volume um, for this show. So it's, um, you know, that's a new technology I feel like is really helping with sustainability as well. And I think, I think, you know, new tech, well, first of all, you're Star Wars, so you're cool. Right. And so everybody is, you know, the one thing that has always kind of driven new technology is it's cool. Right. Like we all and and Tesla did that, you know, obviously. And so so somehow we have to figure out how to amplify our success stories. And and I've and I've seen the net, you know, the studios and the networks have and PGA Green and Real Green and and MPA and everybody's putting out, you know, all the social media content about how great the, and green the sets are. But then I'm still surprised that you'll get somebody who goes, oh, I didn't hear about that. I never knew that or whatever. How can we, like, what do we have to do? I mean, I love, Lydia, that you're putting content, narrative content on screen, obviously, that will change, you know, how you think about the environment. But, you know, do we need a really cool behind the scenes Project Greenlight version of Project Go Green? Does anyone want to come up with that <laughs> or something that will, like how do, how do we get this message out even more than we have? Well, I, I think it's also the framing of the topic, you know? It, um, and, and the, the nice thing now, I do a lot of teachings in, in universities, the, the young people, the young students, they're all for it. They all say, hey, we, we love this. We think this issue is very important. And the other thing, very interesting uh, thing, the main actor of a very famous German series, he called me just a few months ago and he said, hey, Philip, we as actors, and he's the, the main character of this series, we as actors want this production to be green. Please, let's do it. So there's a push coming from that side as well. And I think if we, if we succeed in making the framing for green production uh, to something more cooler and something more creative and something that's also uh, attractive for the creative people. I think this will be a tremendous push. Yeah, anyone else want to jump on that one? Um, I think PR helps too, you know, and, and again, I, I keep talking from this privileged place, but um, you know, what we also try to do is, is, is push in, um, you know, sustainability practices into the EPK packages. Um, and I'll get the publicist and Adrian will get the publicist very involved with doing, you know, behind the scenes of the sustainability practices and, and showing, you know, uh, the fans basically how we do it. And I, th I think that also helps is, is to get, you know, publicity involved with what you're doing. Yeah, I, I think that's true. If you're doing a larger production or if, you, or if you're doing an indie production, you, you generally do have an EPK crew come on to the set at different times while you're, while you're shooting. And I remember on the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks when we did our big, our big start of production meeting with HBO and Oprah was on the, on the call and I just said, you know, we really want to push sustainability on that um, on all of the PR, the behind the scenes EPK, and it happened. They, they sent a crew specifically to cover that. And I think if it, it, sometimes it's just a matter of calling it out and asking for it. Yeah, we were really successful on uh, my last show, The Magicians, the cast and crew, we all did a video, um, you know, talking about our successes and it ended up becoming a training video for all Universal Productions. 
So it was really good to kind of take the time. I mean, it was the last couple of days of shooting of the season. Nobody really wanted to do it at the time, but it was, uh, it was very, very cool. And it, and it made a big impact. And I think it also, again, it was a unifying force. It was something that brought us all together. So I think that was really cool. Um, I'm just looking in the Q and A to see if there's anything. Uh, hold on. Yeah, it always comes down to money. It always comes down to money. It's always about budget. It's always about, you know, how did we do that? Um, we, we do have a cost analysis report that Emily O'Brien, who's a, a green steward, um, created, and it's on the greenproductionguide.com. I encourage anybody who feels overwhelmed by the statistics to, to read it. The reason we did the report was that so producers would have something to show to anybody who's saying it's too expensive as a roadblock. It, we, she did the work, the math, and the stats, and we proved that it's not too expensive. Um, Okay, here's another one. What is the biggest barrier that you've come across to greening sets? Phil? I think it's, it's really the mindset. That to me is when there is a block, uh, it's, it's the mindset. It's, it's prejudices. I see a, a, still a lot of prejudices, uh, especially among creative people, which is kind of strange to me, kind of uh, perplexes me a little bit. But uh, I often have this feeling they're scared that we want to take something away. You know, they're, they're somewhat scared that we put them in a green jail and force them to uh, produce things that are not as nice or whatever. And, and that to me is the, the most important switch uh, that I think has to be done to make people really understand that it's a plus, a plus economically, ecologically, and creatively. And if we succeed in doing this, I've seen so many people then really switching on and, and going for it. One of, the, one, of, one of the challenges sometimes you hear right away is, is for people that aren't as excited about it as we are is what kind of extra work will it be for me, you know, as a crew member? Um, you know, what, what burden am I gonna have? My job is already hard enough. Are you gonna, am I going to have to do all these other things now that are, on top of my job. So I think it's important to always be messaging how important this is and how easy it can be. If everyone just does little pieces, the whole production holistically will be much better off. It, not everyone has to push, push the boulder up the hill. You know, if a few people really get behind it and are you know, excited about it and really run with it, and, uh, and other folks wanna just do their part, whatever that is, but eventually everyone's buying into it, that's, that's great. Because not everyone will be as motivated and excited to, to do everything, no matter how uh, you know, top of mind and important you make it seem for the crew. Um, you know, as long as you make it easy for everyone to do um, certain things, everyone will be able to participate in their own way. Um, and feel good about it. You know, those reports at the end of the job, uh, really um, encouraging folks and also um, pointing out people that are going above and beyond and making them feel good about it. And also giving back to the community. That's really important. If there's a way to do something that's more than just giving a donation, that's actually, you know, on a weekend, if people are interested, going and working at a school, planting a garden, or, you know, doing things of, the, of, of that nature where you're leaving something behind in a community that you've impacted, that's really important for everyone because that's something you've left behind that you could always go and think about and, and, and will have a lasting impact. You're, you know, these productions are like, you know, it's like a, a carnival. You've come, you've set up, you've done your thing, and then you're gone. But if you could leave behind something into the community that's everlasting and, and beneficial, that's great. And for, I mean, that is, that is absolutely our goal. And do you... I know everyone talks about the cost of hiring a sustainability manager, but it sounds like we're all convinced and we just have to convince everybody else that it's actually a very cost effective way of approaching this so that you're not burdening everybody to come up with the solutions. You're, you know, you have a go-to person just like you would have, you know, a department head, like 
you know, dealing with what that department has to, you know, deal with. You wouldn't go into building a set without a construction manager, right? So how, Gavin, how do you? Oh, you just dropped out, but I heard, I heard being passed to me. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I would say that it's tough to prove, you know, adding more crew to be sustainable. Um, but I think you're right, you know, Claire, I, I think that there are so many hidden bonuses in, um, you know, having someone run point on it just because of how that's integrated with, with cost saving measures across, you know, sustainability that, it, you know, most people buy in. I feel like, you know, when I pitched it and said, look, we should really do this, it's really important. Um, it does save money. I'm not gonna be able to prove it to you, you know, right away, but you'll see. And then people kind of get it, you know, after going through it once. So, but yeah, it is, it is a, it's, it's a tougher pitch, honestly, especially when you're more strapped to be able to do it financially. Coming up with the money initially is always the challenge. Um, you know, once, you know, on a smaller job, you know, that the stu that there's not a, you know, HBO, obviously, Marvel, uh, you know, Disney, th th they're all behind it, of course. But it's like when you're an independent film or a smaller project that you don't have that kind of initial support, making the case to carve out that money uh, is always the initial challenge. But if you're able to track it, if you're able to really, um, you know, pr provide a report at the end of the job, all the time, you could see how much you've saved by hiring that person, um, and it's it's really. You can also be creative about it. Um, when I was doing a movie in Africa, we were shooting in Uganda and South Africa, and we I found someone who was a forestry major at the, in the Kampala University. I found a woman who was like really focused on permaculture, and we brought them together. Emily O'Brien gave them training sessions. They ran the green initiative on our set, and it, and they hadn't done it before. But it, we, but we have we have templates and guidelines, and it's not brain surgery. It's it's somebody who was completely focused on doing it. And then when we went to South Africa, interestingly, the South Africa has training programs, and they gave us two people who also were interested in sustainability. But we trained them to they we trained them to be the two people who were focused on what we were doing. And that means we left four environmental stewards behind in Africa when we went home. So, and we've, we've all stayed in touch. We all love to talk about what we're doing. And that you can be creative about it. You don't have to think like, oh, I've got to pay the big bucks person who has a gazillion years of experience, which is really valuable. But it doesn't mean if you can't hire that person, you can't do it, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's uh, an invaluable position. And I think it's something that, like you said, there's a, there's a million ways to come up with that position, but to, to at least have a point person that the crew and everybody can talk to who will do the work, I think that will ultimately save you money for sure. And there, to Tyson's point, I love when you made that point, Tyson, about people sometimes feeling burdened because there's so much stress and pressure all the time. Time is money, time is money. And that person has the ability to take some of that workload off. I found that very, you know, sustainability and really being green means that you've thought ahead, you've made the plan. And that's the time that a lot of times when we're in the thick of it, we lose sight of. And that person has the ability to kind of, well, let me make the calls on how we can recycle this, this situation that you've just brought to our attention, or let me make the calls on how we're gonna wrap those sets and where they can go into storage instead of going into a dumpster, which is what usually happens. So it's, it's that piece that I think that connects to what you were saying, Tyson, which is so important. Yeah, I think that, um you know, we have to, we have to have a plan. We have to put it in place. We have to engage everybody. And, you know, there was a, a, actually one of my actors on my last show is on here. Hi, Brittany. And she's like, what can actors do more? And, and Phil, you brought up a great point of, of starting the initiative, but, you know, and, and there was also another question saying, why aren't the studios pushing? And then Heidi from HBO said, we are pushing, we are pushing. So how do we, you know, we've talked about social media, we've talked about platforms and, and anything else we can ask, you know, actors and studio and everybody else to do, or how do you, you know, how can we drive this 
forward? I know this is, I keep asking that question because I don't know the answer. I just know we keep trying. I know there's green riders out there for, for people, but again, they're not kind of across the board. Do we, um, Lydia, do you think, you know, I know you're, you co-created uh, PGA Green, which is fantastic. Is it, is it going to end up on a policy level? Is it going to end up on a global film community just saying, we're doing this? I think it's, I think it's all part of an organic organism that we're kind of pushing in so many directions. I mean, the one thing that I will say, and we ran a, a new climate narratives webinar at the, at the, you know, after the pandemic was underway and we weren't making movies and we wanted to have, we wanted to keep the conversation going. And I think the storytelling component is really strong because if you are, if you can be a filmmaker who can initiate ideas and my space is narrative filmmaking. So on Radium Girls where it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a small film starring Joey King and Abby Quinn and we, um, it's about girls in the 1920s who were painting glow-in-the-dark watch dials in these factories and slowly being poisoned. But we're working now, we're in release, we're working now with gr many groups, but like including the Sierra Club, where they have a toxics and health program uh, addressing toxic chemical pollution. We all know there's a lot of regulations in America that have been rolled back this year, which is jeopardizing communities across the country. So I think if, when you work with these groups, they're called to actions that are specific to the themes in your film and what you're doing. And I, I really don't think we should underestimate the power of our industry and the power to tell these stories. And we, we should step up and be doing it more as filmmakers. Yeah, I, I, I mean, absolutely. I saw the, you know, watching the narratives uh, panel, the first one from the SPF and, you know, what was shocking is that they were like, you know, one of the questions is name a name an example of a show that really did it all. And and Lydia, yours hasn't come out yet, but I mean, th the panelists were it, they were hard pressed to pick a show that they thought was kind of integrating sustainable practices and sustainable mindset in everything we do. You know, like not having a background performer walk down the street with a bottle with a you know plastic water bottle changing the view of of everything that's happening do you feel that as producers you guys have you know even as line producers and production managers do you feel empowered to go to the props department and to say let's change the packaging on a show totally 100 percent yeah I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well a lot of people a lot of people like yeah. you, you know depending on what position you're at, do you, would I you mean, also- we, did, we were filming a chess competition, one in the South, one of the South Africa sets. I looked over and somehow, I don't know how, it's a water bottle appeared on one of the chess tables and we had rolled the first shot. And I just said, cut, we're, we're not using that shot. Get rid of that bottle. We're, you know, and you know, I work with a director, Mira Nair, who was completely on board about sustainability. And she was like, oh my God, I'm so glad you saw that. We, you know, well, you know, that was like, you have to be vigilant every step of the way. Yeah. Okay. So let's flip that question. If you were a props assistant and you, or, you know, uh, on set third set dress, somebody, you know, Tad, somebody who's not a producer or a director, and you saw that in the shot, which, how do you, how would you feel if that person approached you and said, oh, did you see that plastic bo water bottle? Because I think a lot of, you know, to Tyson's point earlier, a lot of the crew, you know, the, the crew that's just the new crew, the younger crew are already being trained in high schools and, and everything else. And there, there's so much talk about this at a film school level. Um, but then they get onto the real set and then they see, you know, well, us well, older I, folks kind of moving in the same direction. But, How do but we I empower them? But I, th I think, Clara, because you've been talking about policy, you know, I'll give you one example. For instance, Sky in Germany, they said, we don't want any more plastic. That was their first step into uh, sustainability. Then now they want the full package from their producers. And uh, so I think it starts there. If you have a clear policy on certain things, and they, they even went to the point they said they don't want plastic in front of the camera. 
So I remember there was a big cooking show. I was involved with that. So we had to take all the plastics out of the, the kitchen. We had to spend thousands and thousands of euros on getting glassware, metalware, et cetera. And Sky paid for it because I went to Sky and I said, hey guys, you want this production to be without plastic. So you have to come up with funding, with money to pay for that because that's an expensive task. And they did it. And same thing when, when it was about, okay, we want now the full package. We want all of our productions to be green productions. I said, okay, but then we need specialists. Then we need people on site and you have to pay these people on site. And they said, okay, we're paying them because uh, who says A has to say B, you know, you have to follow the line. And that's why I think it's so crucial to have the production, uh, the, the, the broadcasters, the distributors, if these people are online, if they are all agreeing with the sustainable production and a sustainable ideal, then we can say, okay, guys, you want this, but then you also have to pay for it. And that's happening quite nicely now over here because they committed themselves to the self to the same ideals you know and i think that really helps tremendously hey claire and also uh, I, got on, yeah. I think also to answer your question you know coming up from the bottom up it, i think it all comes also down a lot to about you know yeah. communication with the crew and and management style of how you're approaching it and and part of you know what i try to do every day is make myself as approachable as possible. You know, we communicate that we want, that we are a green production, but also that we want to hear ideas from the crew. So, you know, I feel like that always helps, but it's also, it really does come down to, you know, interpersonal communication on many levels and, and approachability, um, you know, and I try to make everybody feel as approachable to me as possible, even though I'm running around like a madman half the time. And it's like, no, I really want to hear your ideas. So if you do see something, you know, say something, we want to hear about it. Um, Tyson, how about you? It's like, I, I think about um, how studios have come down on smoking policies in their films, right? And think about how that's changed, um, you know, how, how years ago it was, it, you know, it, even if it wasn't just society, but on film, you know, um, having folks smoke. And now it's, it's a real issue where we don't want to be projecting things as, you know, that's cool. And I think if we took the same approach with environmental issues, that, that we sort of take, um, you know, that is just as uh, detrimental to us as smoking, then I think that would really, um, you know, I think that's how we s need to think about things. But I think what, what Gavin and, and everyone said is, is true. As a producer, you make yourself available. You make yourself approachable so that everyone feels like they could bring up there because you're not gonna see everything and you need everyone to be able to be on board and have the courage to come to you and say, oh, you know, uh, Lydia, I noticed there was a water bottle. Do you mind if I just, before we roll, run in and get that? If you, you know, if your crew doesn't feel like you're approachable, um, you won't have the collective support to, to figure these issues as a group together, you know, so. Yeah, I, there's a, a question just that just came up in the chat, which is what if the unions for all crew and cast included the right to an environmentally friendly set? And if the unions were required to take the course on green filmmaking, and and in my discussions um you know with kind of a, at a kind of more policy level there seems to be some concern there's always that and i think you touched on it earlier that there's that 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 kind of friction between oh we don't want to enforce too much because we don't want to take away the liberties of people how people are doing their job and and then you know tyson when you brought up smoking which is something that sure a lot of people were really upset that they couldn't light up on set anymore but you know there was a general consensus do you think we can push studios and unions and everybody kind of as part of the covid recovery maybe to just make sure that we are including sustainability as a health and safety concern as opposed to just a you know voluntary action do you think that would fly? Yeah, and, and, and especially if we're going to tie it together, like Lydia said, that COVID and the environment are not so distant. These are two issues that are tied at the hip. And I think if we approach these issues as we move forward as an industry, as one issue that has to be solved, then we're going to put our collective uh, brains together and figure out systems. Unfortunately, it may have to happen in, in, in Philips, uh, Germany, or in Canada first, because certain issues here are very political, 
Um, but but that's not to say that we can't do it on a very on a groundswell that you know on our you know on Lydia's production she can't do that and and do training uh, for the cr for the whole crew. You will always have people that will not totally be on board, but eventually everyone will, and it'll just be a part of our process. You know, change takes a bit of time, and there's always going to be friction. But as we move forward with it eventually everyone will get on board. We do safety training. We do, you know, harassment training. We're, we do now COVID training and we'll do environmental training and sustainability training so that everyone understands. There's no more excuses of, oh, I didn't know. Because what you need for this really to grow and to build is not just the producers and the studios to get on board, but everyone top down. Because if everyone is thinking with a sustainability lens and it's not just, you know, only the folks that you've hired to, in that department or the producers, then everyone's job is, is being looked at with how can I add, you know, how can I recycle this set? How can I, you know, give these props to another job so that I don't have to like put them in storage and they're never used, Wh whatever it is. Everyone's looking at their own individual tasks and job with a, with a view to the future. Yeah, I, I, I think that if we can't pull this together now, you know, like in 2020, after this horrendous year, while we're, we're reinventing ourselves every day with, you know, we're, we're, we're with the new protocols with, you know, Gavin, what you're doing with virtual production and, you know, we just have to keep moving. <laughs> we just have to keep pushing this kind of as hard as we can. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Uh, okay, Gavin, we have one question. Everyone wants to hear about The Mandalorian. How did you transition to, uh, how did you make that transition? Was it, was it? Which, which transition, I'm sorry, to environmentalism or virtual production or, I'm so uh, sorry. Curious to know how large scale productions such as The Mandalorian were able to go green on set. Well, we had a lot of help um, with, with Disney as sustainability as one of our partners. So it really did help us, you know, justify some of the expense to really go crazy with it. You know, um, I had, you know, a lot of buy-in from the crew. Um, I had a lot of help from the GreenSpark group and Adrian to really roll it out. We had a track record from, you know, the show prior of how aggressive we could get. Um, it did help a lot that we're a stage-based show, um, I will admit. So, you know, we didn't, we only traveled to one location, I think the whole, uh, whole season. So that allowed us to actually even take it further because we're, you know, based at a studio or in a back lot. So we could try, you know, a lot of new things like our, you know, methane compost digester, um, that saved That sounds so cool. Yeah, that thing is awesome. <laughs> we're trying to roll it out now across the studio lot down here in Manhattan Beach is what we're gonna to try to do and get other you know shows to buy into it so we can get a bigger one and feed that as well. Cause that, I think we saved like three tons of, uh, you know, what was it, three tons of organic matter that went through that thing um, and kicked out a ton of compost, it's amazing. Um, so, you know, it really just is about as being as aggressive as possible, getting the crew to buy in, like we all keep saying, I, and, and you know, help at the studio level to, to make it happen. Yeah, and I think that what, what's great is a show like The Mandalorian or the larger budget shows, um, like with all the other developing technology, it's got to start there. They have the money, they have the, you know, they have the courage to kind of, you know, try and push the technology. And then once it becomes common and when it's, once it's scalable, it'll become affordable for everybody else. Yeah. So I think, I think there really is a, a leadership role in the, you know, Obviously, like the, the independent filmmakers are saying, I can't afford a, my own methane composter. And no, you probably can't. But if enough people have them, and if they're now become fixtures on all the lots, then you will be able to. So I think that the opportunity we have once we have, if, when we're on big budget shows is just to push, push the you know, suppliers, push the technology, push, the, push everything we can, and you know, use that as, I mean, not the training ground, but you know what I mean, to kind of get people familiar with it so that it becomes commonplace. Yeah, and it helps with like studios that have, you know, multiple tentacles like Disney or Universal that have like theme parks. And we're like, well, look, you know, you could use this at your theme parks or your cruise ships or, you know, all these other examples. So they're all 
much more interested in, in trying these things out because they can apply it across different platforms and not just, you know, movie sets. Um, okay, I think we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So what, you know, um, one question just came in the chat and it was, uh, how can you as producers inspire and educate other producers? Yeah, well, I, go. I think we're doing it by having these conversations. Um, I'm, you know, I'm happy to be part of this Producers Guild initiative because we have over 8,000 members who are producers. So we have a real constituency to talk to and encourage to, to do the work that we've been doing. I think it's getting, I think the conversation's getting easier because the impact of climate change is much more visible in our lives than it's ever been, sadly. But um, we're also in a disruption in our industry right now because of, you know, because of the pandemic, but it's also a disruption that's probably been long in the waiting. And I think that we aren't ever really gonna go back to where production was. We're going to be talking about a new normal as we reinvent what we do. And paying attention to these cultural shifts and working with cultural strategy groups and making sure that underrepresented voices are considered and everything that we're doing is gonna be a big part of the way that we make movies and television series going forward. So it, in that sense, the pandemic has given us time to think about what the world is that we want going forward because we are going to change it. I mean, it, it's changed for us and now we can change it for ourselves. Does anyone else want to take a, a crack at that one? I, I think I think the, the PGA obviously is doing a great job of, of of putting the word out, and and I think that as producers we are all in touch with each other in our own communities. You know, Gavin may speak to his colleagues, um, not just on other um, you know Disney and and and, uh, and Lucas Films. But he will talk to other producers in Los Angeles, and and Phil talks to you know his other co colleagues in Germany, and and as a producer, I'm always sharing ideas, listening, hearing new techniques, and what, wow, I didn't even th how did you do that? What, wow, okay, you did that, and you know, so it's it's a conversation that we're always having, and sometimes you know there's a program either at the PGA or sometimes you learn about something on a on a Google group board or you know it's just. We're sharing ideas. I mean, that's what, what we do well, um, is communicate amongst each other, I think. Um, and, and, and I think ultimately we all are, are um, inquisitive folks to be a, to be a good producer. You, you are, have to be a good listener and you have to ask a lot of questions and wanna learn. And I think that we are, this is a, you know, a changing environment every day, every week, there's new things. And if you're open to it and wanna learn and try new things and aren't scared that something's gonna fail, then it, you're gonna try it and you're gonna do it and some will succeed and, and, and it'll help the whole environment. Um, you know, it's like, it's like Lydia said, we're at a crossroads right now. And, and look, I mean, whether it be too many hours that hadn't been addressed on set or whether it be environmental issues or whether it be people not being able to, to get home enough and now people are home too much or working at home and they're gonna find the balance. We're gonna find the balance on all of these things. Um, it was forced upon us, but here we are and we're gonna, we're gonna move forward from it. Yeah, I, I found that even in the last, you know, when the industry shut down in March, there were suddenly there were these um, these amazing town halls and there were these these webinars and there were the you know these conferences that of of people who obviously weren't too busy to do them because nobody was working but um the collaboration in the last year or last eight months has been so much greater than it ever has before so you know i'm feeling really hopeful that we're going to get this message out um as much as we can um Okay, call to action. Does anyone have anything they want to say or in, ask people to do? Phil, yeah, I'm well, going to start with you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I think uh, education is key. Training is key. Um, I find, uh, at least over here, uh, if you look in, in a country like Germany, there's not many opportunities for gaffers, for set designers, 
for all these different uh, trades and, and, and uh, jobs to, to do trainings on green production, on new materials, new technologies and stuff like that. And I think this is really key um, to, to enhance that and to show to people what is actually possible. And very often I encounter people who look at me and they, with, with their big eyes open saying, I didn't know that, I, I didn't even know this exists. And um, so I think this is still a major, major issue, information, training, and education. I think that the, uh, you know, I find that the awareness, like, like we touched on, I mean, the, I think we need to aggregate. I think we need to look at our industry as a whole. And I think that once you put those numbers together, they become terrifying. You know, I know that in Vancouver, for example, in 2019, we burn 9 million liters of diesel on film productions. You know, um, and I think that by sharing those numbers, those big scary numbers, and giving people a place to start from, or even to understand it, and, and Real Green is pretty fantastic with that. I encourage anyone who hasn't seen it to watch the Be Real Green video that just kind of out, just puts it out there. And Albert has the same thing. And, and once we kind of start with those, like we said, you have to measure it, right? But it has been measured. I know that we're still working on measuring it even more. You know, we're perfectionists. We want to know exactly what has happened, but but we do know globally how powerful our industry is, how you know how much of an impact our industry is, and and how much revenue we make as well. We have an incredible dollar value that we are able to put in the right place. So. You know, I'd, I'd like to just give one more plug for greenproductionguide.com because we are constantly yeah. updating, refreshing, trying to make it as relevant as possible. You will see that when you go on the homepage. We've recently started an educational webinar series called Seeds, which is where we did the new climate narratives and we just did one for green film schools. And we're going to continue to do those. But it is a partnership with PGA Green and very dedicated sustainable representatives from all of these studios and streamer companies it's you know everybody has come to the table and everybody wants to be involved but just what you were talking about claire i mean this kind of data and these kind of statistics these are conversations that are had at a higher level in the studio system we're trying to you know talk about how do we convey this data in a way that's meaningful to people on the ground but we know we can do it on our own productions we know we can take those um, calculations and share them with everybody that we're working with. And, um, you know, we just, we just have to keep having these conversations. It is getting better. I can't even tell you how hard it was when I started in this industry. It was really dire and, and very uphill, but it's really encouraging to be here with all of these producers today, hearing what everybody's doing and, and hearing the positive results that are happening. It's, um, it's happening. So we just have to keep, we have to keep connecting. I think what Tyson said is right. We need to network, we need to talk, we need to just all stand together. Okay, Gavin. <laughs> yeah, I was actually just gonna echo the same thing that you know, communication is, is really key and, and, and hearing it from all, all angles is, is one of my favorite things to do is to participate in, in panels such as this or, or you know talking to crew members hanging out around catering well we used to be able to hang out around catering and you know have conversations about the food that we're eating and how that impacts the environment just casually rather than blasting it at people and signaging them to death you know it's just there's just ways of going about it i feel like that you know are, are more constructive and, and you know and, and trying to do it in, in the most informative way possible yeah, I definitely, I mean, I, I point everyone towards PGA Green and to look at, look at, you know, the work you have done has just been unbelievable. And, you know, the work that all of you've done has been like, you know, just, it's so fantastic to see like-minded people <laughs> and see us all rowing in the same direction. And, you know, as we communicate to other producers, they, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And suddenly you can. Um, I just wanted to share with you, I had a, a conversation with a crew member the other day and I, I said I was going on, I was on this panel and, and, you know, they're in the height of COVID and it's, you know, it's a hard show to begin with and it's just crazy. And 
Um, and I would say that, you know, the person I was talking to had about a, on a scale of one to 10, they were about a four on sustainability. Like, yeah, I know it's there, but I have so much work to do. I'm so exhausted. You can't put that on me. So um, they were on location survey and they went up towards uh, Squamish here in BC and they were in the, you know, on the ocean looking at the, you know, looking at the mountains, you know, the whales are going by, it's absolutely, absolutely pristine and they're looking on a, they're on a location survey and they're looking for where they're going to put their set. And, you know, they started gravitating towards, you know, the spot with the best lighting, the clearest, you know, the flattest ground, all that sort of stuff. And then somebody said, oh no, we can't disturb the moss. So they moved their entire production um, just so that they could preserve the moss that they knew was hundreds of years old. I don't know if that would have happened two or three years ago. So, I mean, I find that super, super encouraging. But um, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. everybody, for participating. Thank you, uh, gosh, uh, to Real Green and to all the panelists. And I'm going to hand it over to Randy, my coworker uh, from SIM. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What an amazing session. It's an awesome way to close out uh, uh, the SPF this year, which we've been so thrilled to be part of at SIM. Um, and I just wanted to thank all the, the panelists for sharing your stories and the, the participants for um, amazing questions and comments in the chat box throughout this 90 minutes it flew by. Um, it's so hard to pull out a, a, a single call to action, isn't it? It really is tough. So I feel like I picked up some gems from each of you and I just wanted to um, put them back on the table for, for some reflection. And um, the first thing that I wanted to, and we've talked about this a lot, but the green production guide and all other tools that are available out there. There are so many tools that will help to prove the business case, the return on investment, as you've all talked about. When sustainability is truly embraced, it does save money in the long run. So um, find the tools, use the tools. Real Green has them. Um, I've put a, a, a note in the chat box about a, a new uh, tool out there. Uh, it's called Ontario Green Screen. Um, I know they've, they, there's a community meeting coming up. So uh, please check it out and join that and, and any other uh, spaces and forums that you can be part of to help to, to influence the, the structural change that are, changes that are needed. Um, so that's my first call to action is use the tools, prove the value. Um, Ontario Green Screen's got some good ones. Real Green's got many, of course, and, and the, um, there, there are many. Before I run out of time, I also just wanted to say something that you all talked about that I think is really important is find your champions and make them visible. Um, Make sure that the people who are on set, who are your early adopters and your ambassadors for sustainability are, are, are really seen in that light. And, and I also heard give everybody a chance to contribute in some way. Give everybody a chance to really be part of these changes. So um, I think those are really important calls to action. And then finally, you've all talked about this and I was so inspired. You know, what, find a way to leave a legacy, a sustainability legacy at the end of your production so that um, that it can be a touchstone for the community, a reminder about how this industry is evolving and, and how actually that community was a part of the evolution just by being the location where the, the production took place. So um, I think sharing feedback and sharing success stories is something that we've been doing throughout the Sustainable Production Forum. And I just encourage all of you to use your voice and whatever media platforms you can to continue sharing these success stories so we can truly make sustainable production the new normal that it's becoming. Um, and thank you, just to, thanks to Clara for moderating this session and to all of the panelists for sharing your stories and we'll continue to um, keep up this good work and hopefully see you at the next one. Thank you to the GreenSpark Group for hosting uh, the Sustainable Production Forum once again, always inspiring.